All right, praise the Lord. How's everyone this morning? Awesome. So glad to be here at my brother's church. So proud of him. Man, he is shaking the world right here from North Carolina, isn't he? You hear him pray one time, and you know that's true, right? Praise the Lord. He's doing a great work here, and we always love it when we get to come visit. Let me introduce you to my family. My wife Susie's there. She'll wave at you. And then my niece, Avery, is hiding in there, too. My daughter, Selah, my son, Josiah, my daughter, Sierra, my new son, Michael, and my daughter, Savannah. So there's my gang. Yeah. Praise the Lord. I want to thank Shane and his wife, Jamie, for the opportunity to minister to you guys while we're up here for Thanksgiving. Man, we have eaten a lot of food this week. <laughs> And we've hiked quite a bit, too, and our knees are feeling it today. But, uh, man, we love to be out there in the forest, and we love to be out here in North Carolina. What a joy, what a joy. Uh, Shane led you this morning in the Advent Scripture reading, which came um, from the story of Ruth. And it's such a fitting message this morning because Ruth later would marry Boaz there in Bethlehem, known as the house of bread. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we're grateful that we can come into this house of bread, Lord Jesus, to receive a fresh word. We pray, God, that it'll enter into us, God, and bring transformation deep down into the core of who we are, and that we can go out from here, Lord, ready to make a difference in the lives of men and women, boys and girls all around the world. We thank you for your goodness and your grace that we have the joy to give you thanks during this season every single year. Thank you, God, for all you've done for us, all you're doing now, and all you're going to do. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen, amen, amen. I'm going to kick it off this morning with a reading from the book of Micah, the prophet, from chapter 5, leading us into the story about the house of bread, Bethlehem. It says this in verse 2, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrata, are only a small village among all the people of Judah. Yet a ruler of Israel, whose origins are in the distant past, will come from you on my behalf. Whose origins are in the distant past. Let's continue. The people of Israel will be abandoned to their enemies until the woman in labor gives birth. Then at last, his fellow countrymen will return from exile to their own land. And he will stand to lead his flock with the Lord's strength in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. Then his people will live there undisturbed, for he will be highly honored around the world, and he will be the source of peace. Can somebody say amen? Praise the Lord. Well, Micah wrote this around 650 years after David was crowned king. So David is long gone, and here's this prophecy of someone who's going to be like David and come and fulfill the prophecy of Micah that this new Messiah would be born to redeem God's people. Indeed, some people were looking for the hope that he could free them from the tyranny of the oppressors of the time, which were Greece and then Rome and and then uh, several other kingdoms that existed like Persia in between those time periods. But we see here that a new king would be crowned. 700 years later, This prophecy would be fulfilled in the birth of our Savior, who we honor today on our first Sunday of Advent. Praise the Lord. Now, David's father lived in Bethlehem, Jesse. And so all of David's brothers were born there. David was born there. The priest Samuel anointed David king in that same place. Joseph and Mary would have to travel about 90 miles to get there from Nazareth. And Nazareth was just a small city, a small little hamlet even, a village within a village. The religious leaders of the day all believed that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. They had looked at this prophecy 
and had been waiting for that time to come. There was an expectation that one day a ruler would come to Bethlehem to set God's people free. And most had anticipated a political freedom. But God was foretelling of a spiritual freedom that would restore the relationship between God and people, would give us abundant life. And as you can imagine, 700 years of waiting shrouded the prophecy in all kinds of mystery and legend. When would it happen? When would the Messiah come? The world waited, yes, but the world was waiting in a way like we are waiting now for the Messiah to come back, for Jesus to return and bring us all home. The world waited then as we wait now, wondering, when would the day be? When would the hour be? Are you ready? Were they ready? Bethlehem, as you've heard already today, literally means house of bread, providing bread, no doubt, for the nearby city of Jerusalem, which sat five miles away. Bethlehem was first mentioned in Genesis 35 as the place where um, Rachel would die and where the marriage of Ruth and Boaz would take place, as the place where David longed to get back to when the enemy had encamped there. And David said, oh, how I long for the waters of Bethlehem. And some of his mighty men snuck into the camp just to get him some of that water, as we may remember. It was the birthplace of Jesse, and David, and Jesus. Born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. Does anybody love bread in here, anybody? You know, you're really into it. You know, we had some of those Hawaiian rolls for uh, Thanksgiving. If you've seen the commercial, like the roll flying across, you know, the house and lands right in somebody's mouth, you know we never got to do the roll throwing. We're going to have to make up for that. But uh, get, you just got to catch the bread in your mouth. Those Hawaiian rolls are taste so good, and they just, they're the perfect size for that. Well, the smell of fresh bread just makes you feel right at home, doesn't it? And if you've been in a bakery before, you love to just stand there a while, take in the sights, take in the smell, sample all the cookies and good things. Man, we grew up in a town that had some great bakeries, some great Italian bakeries, some great Cuban bakeries. And I can remember my daughters when we'd buy the Cuban bread, which is almost three times as long as this one, imagine. And uh, we'd buy it, and Savannah and Sierra would carry it on their shoulders, you know, like, you know, in, in like a parade of the bread that we have now <laughs> purchased. And we're just so excited to eat that before we even put the car in reverse, we had already ripped half the bread apart and had eaten it as we we're driving down the road. We always had to buy more than one for that reason. I'd arrive home and I'd say, I don't know what happened. We bought this bread and look, you know, it's missing a good chunk of it. And my wife's like, you say that every time, you know, you know. But we love to go to that bakery a friend of mine named David, he lives in a town that has a German baker, and we'd go there, and I'd love to see all the different varieties of bread. As missionaries in the Caribbean, we'd love to go to this little bakery where we could buy these small little mastiff breads, right? And we'd want to go after church on a Wednesday night when they were hot, and we would just, man, couldn't wait for that experience. And maybe you have some memories just like that. Bread can really impact the senses, and we celebrate our Thanksgiving feast with cornucopias and things made of bread and banana bread and pumpkin bread, right? At Christmas, my wife makes monkey bread for all of her little monkeys and one, ba and one bald baboon, right? Yeah, fresh bread, right? How do you know it's fresh? You remember from Ratatouille, who saw that movie? It's the sound, the sound of the bread. You gotta hear it crackle, right? Yeah, that's the, that's how you know it's fresh. Well, bread is known as the basic food of human life. It's known as the staff of life. You know, indeed, sometimes it looks like a staff. And all over the world, bread is a principal food of humanity. And in places where they have no bread, they may have bread fruit and have an alternative where they could have a kind of bread. And give us this day our daily bread could mean not only bread, but all the things that go along with bread the bread. And Bethlehem was known as a place just like that. Maybe a place where you can always grab a meal on the way into Bethlehem or on the way out. It wasn't on the highway, so you had to get off the beaten path to get there. But indeed, it was famous 
Jesus said that he was the bread of life, that he was the living bread, that he was the true bread of heaven. I'm foreshadowing a bit as we go in to the first reading of the gospel story on this Christmas. Here we are, Luke chapter 2. At that time, the Roman emperor, Augustus, decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, his fiancée, who was now obviously pregnant. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her first child, a son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. Suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. They were terrified, but the angel reassured them, Don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will be great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. And you will recognize him by this sign. You will find a baby wrapped snugly in strips of cloth, lying in a manger. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, the armies of heaven, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to those with God, to those with whom God is pleased. When the angels had returned to heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem. Let's see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. They hurried to the village and found Mary and Joseph, and there was the baby lying in the manger. After seeing him, the shepherds told everyone what had happened and what the angel had said about this child. All who heard the shepherd's story were astonished, but Mary kept all these things in her heart and thought about them often. The shepherds went back to their flocks, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen. It was just as the angel had told them. Praise the Lord. As we read in the story, Jesus was not born in a house of royalty. He was not born in a palace, in a house of riches, or the house of a celebrity. He was born in a little town, not even on the highway, a little town called Bethlehem. It wasn't in Rome, and it wasn't in Caesarea, it wasn't in Athens, and it wasn't in Alexandria. It was not in any major city of the time. It wasn't any political, commercial, cultural, highly educational, or, or socially significant city. It was just a bedroom community, a place where you could get a bite to eat. He was born in the house of bread. You, you might say he was born in the bakery. bakery for Jerusalem. You might find that statement kind of old, I mean kind of odd, I should say, old, but uh, because we often hear of him born in the manger and seldom hear about this place of bread. But what you're going to learn this morning is that bread had significance from the city in which Christ was born, those historical figures who had interacted there, but later into what Christ was trying to communicate to the people he interact, interacted with about who was the bread of life. One little story stitched in, woven into a tapestry of stories that would paint us a picture that we could forever remember when we looked at a loaf of bread, that it reminded us of who Jesus is. Perhaps Joseph and Mary on entering Jerusalem Maybe they could smell the bread in the distance. Maybe the shepherds camped in the hillside near Bethlehem because of the bread. But right there in the house of bread, as we've read in the Scriptures, it seems that people were going to miss the miracle of living bread. One of the lesser-known 
verses of O Little Town of Bethlehem goes like this. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessing of His heaven. No ear may hear His coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive Him still, the dear Christ enters in. So let's pick up that story about bread later in the life of Christ. I believe Jesus is trying to teach us something, and we're going to learn something in the bakery this morning. We jump forward a few passages to John chapter 6. We have this story about Jesus ministering to people and wondering where they were going to get enough food to feed them all. Let's jump into that story. In John chapter 6, it says in verse 1, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly the time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, Where can we buy bread to feed all these people? Verse 6 says that Jesus was testing Philip because he already knew what he was going to do. Imagine if Jesus tested you with a question when he already knew what he was going to do. Testing your faith to see if you were going to step out believing that he was going to provide that he was going to be there when you had nothing to show. What would you do if Jesus asked you to come up with a bakery miracle? The cake boss has just put in the order for what seemed would take months to complete, and it was going to take a lot of faith to accomplish it, and it was going to take even more faith later on for them to believe in something called living bread. Would they be ready for it? In order to be ready for the living bread, they'd first have to be ready for a miracle of physical bread. Philip replied, even if we worked for months, Lord, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There there is a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish, but what good is that with this huge crowd? Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks to God, and distributed them to everyone. uh, It distributed them to the people. Afterward, he did the same with the fish. And they all ate as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, Now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. When the people saw him do this miraculous sign, they exclaimed, Surely he is the prophet we have been expecting. When Jesus saw that they were ready to force him to be their king, he slipped away into the hills by himself. Wow, what a miracle! People said, surely this is the prophet that Micah had talked about. But somehow they missed him in Bethlehem over 30 years prior. But now they were starting to pick up the scent of fresh bread. And just as they accepted David as their king, they were ready to accept Jesus as their king right there at that moment. But Jesus was not ready to step into that because he wanted to be a spiritual king also that would free not only the Hebrew children, not only the Israelites, but to be a savior for every individual in the world. The next day, Jesus follows up his miracle with a message about living bread. We jump into verse 22, and it says, The next day, the crowd had stayed on the far shore. They saw that the disciples had taken the only boat, and they realized that Jesus had not gone with them. 
Several boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the Lord had blessed the bread and the people had eaten. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went across to Capernaum to look for him. They found him on the other side of the lake and asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. You want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous sign. But don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of His approval. The people were like, hey, Jesus, can you do that bread trick again? I mean, that was so awesome. And, you know, even better, can you teach us how to do that bread trick? Because, you know, then we would not need to bake bread anymore, and we could probably make a few dollars off of this, too. So we would really like you to show us this bread trick, please. They replied, we want to perform God's work, too. What should we do? Jesus told them, this is the only thing God wants you to do. Are you ready? Are you ready? Here's the trick. Believe. Believe in the one that God has sent. They answered, show us a miraculous sign. If you want us to believe in you, you know, show, the, show us the miracle again. Do the trick. What can you do? What else can you do? After all, our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness while they journeyed. The Scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father gave you bread from heaven. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. You see, the people were so focused on their stomachs that they could not internalize the concept of bread for their hearts, of living bread, of of, of spiritual sustenance that was going to carry them through this life and into a life everlasting. Jesus was hoping that the miracle of the bread would open their eyes to the living bread that was standing right in front of them. Jesus then replied to say it as clear as possible. I am the bread. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But you haven't believed in me, even though you have seen me. However, those the Father has given me will come to me, and I will never reject them. For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. And this is the will of God, that I should not lose even one of those he has given me but that I should raise them up at the last day. For it is my Father's will that all who see His Son and believe in Him should have eternal life. I will raise them up at the last day. And then the people began to murmur in disagreement because He said that He was the bread of life that came down from heaven. And they said, isn't this Jesus? Isn't this Joseph and Mary's son? Didn't He grow up right here? Wasn't He living in Nazareth? Does anything good come out of Nazareth? You know all the statements that you can imagine they they would say. We know his father. We know his mother. We we know his siblings. How can he say that he came down from heaven? People were like, you know, how can a person be bred? And how can this boy Jesus we've watched grow up possibly know anything about bread from heaven? How can he think he is the cake boss, right? How can he think that he can, can bring us this awesome bread? Isn't he the carpenter's son? They're not even bakers in his family. Jesus replied, stop complaining about what I said. For no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws them to me. And at the last day, I will raise them up as it is written in the Scriptures. They will be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from Him comes to me. 
not that anyone has ever seen the Father, only I who, has, who was sent from God have seen Him. Here it is. I tell you the truth. Anyone who believes has eternal life. Yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever. And this bread which I will offer so the world may live is my flesh. A lot of reading in today's scripture because I don't want you to miss any of the connections that Christ is is weaving together here. Any of these connections about what the prophecy had foretold about Bethlehem house of bread about the people who were born there and the people who lived there and how difficult it would be for Christ to be able to come into a world when the devil was scheming all the time to try to make it impossible for that to happen. Expecting him to come in in mighty cities and instead he comes in the small little hamlet. Born in the backwoods, so to speak. All these little connections so that Jesus could finally come and say, I am the bread. And even though he came down and even though he performed the miraculous signs and and even though he said it clearly, many of them missed it. Let us not even in our time miss out this Thanksgiving season on what the bread is and on who the bread is during our Thanksgiving feasts. But when he said that they had to eat his flesh, you know, then they really freaked out. I'm like, oh my goodness. I think I've heard of churches like this. You know, where you get slain by the Spirit, washed in the blood, and you have to eat the flesh, right? Have, I mean, that's a horror movie for sure. Right? I mean, people were afraid. Right? What is this? You know, a lot of this Christian jargon can scare some people away. They don't understand the context, Right? But what Jesus is really saying is that he is offering his life to them as bread that is broken, as wine that is poured out. He is offering himself for the redemption of humankind. But the people just couldn't get past their stomachs. I felt that way yet after Thanksgiving, man. I, I, I couldn't see my shoestrings, man. I, I couldn't get past my stomach. But these people, I mean, all they could think about was bread for today. Just like the manna in the wilderness. Only lasted a day. They tried to store it up for the next day and it had worms in it. They were missing the point back then and here they were missing the point again. What is he really saying? He's saying that he is the bread of life. In verse 58. He continues, he said, your ancestors ate man on the wilderness and they all died. But I am the true bread that came down from heaven. And anyone who eats this bread will not die. If you think about it, he's making the connection to one of our favorite verses here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him would not perish but have everlasting life. He keeps going with this believe word, believe word, believe word, and all they wanted was the eat word, the eat word, the eat word. Give me more bread to eat. I want to make a sandwich today, banana bread, banana uh, waffles, you know, all those banana, banana things, right? In verse 59, you catch something else hidden in the background of the story, and I love this, I love this. It says, and we might skip this verse if, if, we, if we didn't look too closely. It says that Jesus said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. So he's there in the synagogue and he's teaching there. And right behind Jesus would have been the entire a priestly table full of the things of remembrance. And on top of that table would have been the showbread the symbol that God had provided food for them when they were in the wilderness. So Jesus is standing there, born in the house of bread, talking to people 
about bread and how it is no longer, it's not only in this temple made of human hands, but it should be in the temple of the person as well. Are you catching the the imagery behind Jesus? Not only did he say it with his words, but he had all these object lessons. Since the days of Moses and the miraculous manna from heaven, that showbread had been put in the temple. It symbolized the presence of the Lord, the, the bread of the presence, it was called. It symbolized the sacrifice that would come. It was known as the sacrificial bread. It symbolized his holiness, the consecrated bread, the bread that was set aside, and and nobody was supposed to eat that bread. And if it got old, they'd bake new bread and put that there and get rid of the old one. I can remember when I was a a kid, Shane, one time I was in the church parking lot, and the church, one of the church vans was open. So I had climbed in, and I was sitting in there, and there was like a whole bag of communion crackers, right? And so I did what every kid would do. You know, I like crackers, so I ate some, right? I ate some. And, and I, at one time in my life, I started to feel bad about that. You know, maybe I didn't make the connection. You know, I'm eating these communion crackers. But then I read that King David did the same thing, right? And, man, I was in good company, right? It's so awesome. Man, but Jesus is really hoping people will make the connection between all of those stories about bread and the, the people who'd been growing up, growing up hearing these stories. And bread seemed to have this kind of prophetic storyline that arrives at its revelation right here in the temple, in the synagogue of Capernaum. Prophets talked about his birth in Bethlehem. Bethlehem was King David's ancestral town. It had manna on the table behind Jesus as he talked. The showbread was was symbolizing that manna, right? Jesus called himself the bread of life. And soon we would hear, this is my body, which is broken for you. See how the story kept going? You see how the, the bread was a symbol. And, and, and you can go into other stories and like, unless a, a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it, it, cannot, it cannot bear fruit. I mean, there's so many connections and parallels that we can pull into it. But Jesus really wanted people to get that connection between manna in the wilderness and living bread now. The miracle of the bread and the fish and the miracle of the bread now. The, the bread of life that he talked about. This boy born in the house of bread and had come to be born in us, to be bread in us. All God's children love living bread. One time I attended a funeral service for a Salvation Army worker. And uh, coming in was similar to other funeral services I had been at. There were different uniforms that I, I, first time I had taken notice to. But, uh, man, it was an amazing service. I mean, the service was for a woman who baked bread for all of the ministry events in the city. And so she was well known for her bread. They even had bread baking in the funeral service. You could smell it while you're sitting there. And an African choir came up and sang, Calvary's love will sail forever. You know, they sang this beautiful song in like, you know, four to six part harmonies. It was amazing. It was a cappella. It was beautiful. I mean, every emotion that could be stirred was stirred. And her son was there giving her honor. And he spared no expense in this service. I mean, it was amazing. And as they carried her casket out of the building, all of the... The Salvation Army soldiers, so to speak, stood like on uh, facing each other so that the casket would pass in the middle. And as the casket passed, they'd all do this. It was a, it's a salute that they do, which means to God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory in her life who gave us physical bread But she had been eating spiritual bread too. 
And she was on her way to heaven. Who knows? Maybe she'll be in the baking on that marriage supper of the Lamb, right? Indeed, she had a passion for it. Don't you want to take this bread for yourself? Don't you want some of this spiritual bread? Isn't it about time you open your heart to receive this living bread? Can't you see that there's so much more that God wants for you to experience and that he wants for you to understand? He is the bread of life. He is the living bread. He is the true bread that comes down from heaven. He came to give us abundant life and life more abundantly. Have you reached that point in your spiritual journey where, you, where you're walking and, and you're just looking for more? Well, this bread is, is always available in as much as you eat this bread for every time you eat this bread. You are remembering that Jesus died for you until he comes again. Just as bread always belonged in the temple of old, it belongs in the temple of your heart. Wasn't it Paul who, who rewrote an, a scripture from Isaiah who said, Here, O Lord, have I prepared a resting place. Because what house made by human hands could ever contain you? The bread, as it did in the temple, does the same in you. It represents the life of Christ. Jesus, the bread of life in you. Bread that symbolizes the presence of the Lord in your temple, in your heart. Bread that honors the sacrifice that Jesus offered for you. Each time you eat this bread, you are announcing that Jesus died for you until he comes again. Bread that is a reminder for you to be holy and set apart because of Christ living in you. That just as that showbread was symbolic on a table, your life is symbolic before everybody you, you encounter out into the world. You are now the bread of the presence in your world. Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16 says this. It says, is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. This is a thanksgiving ceremony made for sharing. As we read here about the cup of thanksgiving and the bread that we break for thanksgiving, just like the thanksgiving that we celebrate with the meals with our families, they are meant to be shared. This was meant to be shared. Not just a simple ceremony that you internalize personally for your own personal spiritual sensory experience. But something to be taken into a world of people who have never received. Communion is the act of sharing. It is holding something in common. Communion. Holding something in common. It is participating with someone. And so here at a communion table... We are one with Christ in a relationship with the blood and the body of Jesus Christ. As, as many of you know, my family and, and I, we were missionaries in the Caribbean on an island called the Commonwealth of Dominica. And we loved it there. Oh, man, God did such great ministry and great work there. And it wasn't without missionary hardships that missionaries experienced. I could remember... Shane, that there was one period of time where, for some reason, the electricity bill on our house skyrocketed, and it took three months to figure out what the problem was. And we may have been paying for the whole building in a three-story building, right? And then there was an extreme increase in the water bill as well. So there was a leak underneath the bathtub that nobody knew about because it wasn't coming into the house. It was going down the outside side of the wall, three months. Three months into this, to figure out the problems, we had no money left. 
No money to buy Mastiff bread from the bakery on Wednesday night. I came home. My wife says, there's nothing to feed the kids. I open the refrigerator up. There's a, a bottle of ketchup in there. That's it. But no bread to make a ketchup sandwich, right? And I said, well, guys, we're just going to have to pray then. Because God told us to come here. He said he would take care of us. And so we're going to believe that he'll provide. So we all grabbed hands and went into one of the rooms of the house. And I said, a simple prayer. I said, God, you called us here. You said you'd take care of us. And today we have no food to eat. And so we're asking for, we're asking for your intervention, for you to provide, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Within the hour, there was a knock at the door. And I, I opened the door. And there's a guy from my church named Molly. And Molly, um, he was a school teacher, but he ran this kind of side fishing business, right? He had a little fishing boat, and he'd hire guys to go out and fish, right? He comes to my door, Pastor Jerry, man, you won't believe all these fish we caught here, man. Look at these string of fish right here. Flying fish, too. Flying. Have you, do you like flying fish? You want these fly? I said, brother, I will take those fish. Thank you so much. And I can remember my son and I eating that flying fish. I mean, we didn't care what kind of fish it was. We had just prayed, and there was a knock at the door. We heard another knock. Open the door, and Anderson is there. Pasta Jetty. Anderson's a banker. He said, Pasta Jetty, my banana tree produces first fruits, and I want you to have those fruits. And he gives us the whole bunch of bananas. I mean, you know, you couldn't even put it on your head and dance with it. It was so, so many bananas, right? My son's trying to hold it. You know, he's, he's like uh, pulling him over is so heavy. And they were those little kind of sweet, sweet bananas. Oh, man, they were so good. And within the hour, I heard a notification on my phone. Ring. I look. $400 deposited into my missions account. I mean, we needed a miracle of bread. We had living bread, but God really provided some physical bread that day, too. That lasted the entire month. We were not without ever again. We would go to the Mastiff Bread Bakery on Wednesday nights all the time after that. God was so good. Well, I had to know who sent that donation. So I go online, I'm checking it out, and there was a guy named Nick who had given $400. He had no idea we were praying. He had no idea he, would, he was listening to God speak. He just was giving from his heart. Now, Nick had received the Lord as a college student at the University of Tampa. He was out on a Saturday sunbathing on a towel, and we were handing out water bottles in the community that had, like, our church information on it. You know, creative teaching, dynamic drama, strategic sharing, strong coffee, all those great things that churches do. Yeah, strong coffee was on there. And he was like, strong coffee? I'm going to go to that church. So he did. He comes to church. I lead him to the Lord. And he, like, dove right into being involved in everything the church did. Now, this was many years prior. And I, I just thank God because you never know the connection you're going to make when you tell someone about Jesus or when you offer someone a cup of cold water in his name, right? I had no idea that that, had we not handed out water bottles that day, maybe we would not have had a $400 donation. I, I don't know. But we handed it out. And Nick accepted the Lord. To this day, he lives for the Lord, lives, lives in Charleston now. Good buddy of mine. And three years ago, we were right here having Thanksgiving at Shane's house, at Pastor Shane's house. And I said, Shane, can we invite Nick? Shane knew the story. Nick, at this point, had no idea. So Nick comes, his wife was in, uh, in Belarus at the time for 
a doctor appointment. So he was going to be by himself for Thanksgiving. He came with his dog. We had a wonderful time hiking. And we're sitting around the Thanksgiving table, and all the food is there. And, and Shane prays. And I said, all right, right before we eat, I just have something that I'm thankful for I want to share. And I told them, I told Nick that story just like I told you. And I mean the tears around the table and the joy in our hearts about how God had provided bread when we needed it and how Nick was obedient to the Lord when he heard God say, hey, why don't you make that deposit? He had no idea. We had just prayed. As we enter into communion today, Understand that you are partaking of prophetic revelation. Understand that you are partaking in a ceremony that marks the offering of Jesus' life for the redemption of your soul. Understand that living bread is for you to receive and it is for you to share. Understand that God wants to use your life as bread that is broken, as wine that is poured out for the people of the world. Because as we've learned this morning, Jesus is the bread of life. He was born in Bethlehem, the house of bread. He was born to give us life. He is the true bread from heaven. He is the fulfillment of the symbolic show bread in the temple. He is living bread in you. And his bread is for sharing. And we are re-gifted in this message of re-gifting with his bread ceremony Every time we take communion together, regifting like communion is, it is that gift that keeps on giving. It is that gift from Jesus that reminds us of a greater gift to come. We can take of the ceremony continually. The greater gift to come is that Jesus broke the bread with his, with his disciples. And he drank from the cup. And he put the cup down like I'm putting this water down. And he said, I will not drink from that cup again until we drink it together in my Father's house. Jesus is waiting for you to sip from that cup. And he's telling us to keep sipping to keep eating, to keep celebrating, to continually do it. For every time you do it, you are re-gifting. Every time you eat this bread, you are re-gifting. Every time you drink from the cup, you are re-gifting because you're taking it into yourself and you're sharing it with someone else. And you're celebrating that Christ died for you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, you can take your elements You'll find them under your seat. It says this, For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord Himself, that on the night when He was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and He broke it. And He gave thanks to God for it broke it in pieces and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this to remember me. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your bread that was broken for us. For the prophetic storyline that you've given us so that we can continue the story, so that we can weave into the fabric of destiny, Lord Jesus, all of those wonderful prophecies that have been fulfilled and those yet to be, uh, yet to be fulfilled in the lives of your people who are now actively participating in this ceremony all around the world. No other ceremony is celebrated as much as this ceremony right here. So God, we take it, believing and knowing that you born in the house of bread, you want us to have the living bread inside of us. And we take this physical bread now as a symbol of the spiritual bread 
that resides within us in the name of Jesus Christ. Let's take it together. In the same way, Jesus took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and His people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it, for every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until He comes again. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You for Your blood, God. Your blood that was shed for us. You said without the shedding of blood, there would be no forgiveness of sins. So God, we thank you that our sins are forgiven. That we can walk faith, courage, and empower believing that you are going before us. That your living bread that's residing within us is ordering our footsteps. And that this wine is bringing healing into the broken places of our lives. In Jesus' name, let's all take the, the wine together. Would you just give God some glory this morning? Would you just worship Him and honor Him in this moment? God, we love you. We thank you for that living bread, Lord. We thank you for that bread of life, that living water, and that new wine. God, we thank you that we are the showbread. We are the showbread created for good works that you planned for us long, long ago. We love you, praise you, and thank you. In Jesus' name, the church said, amen and amen.